My name is Dan Hughes. I was the Nick Software webinar trader from 2009 to 2014. And uh, after that, I've, I've moved on to teach at RIT. So I'm, I actually teach photography at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and I'm in the photographic science department, which might not mean a whole lot to everybody here, but it sure is a fun job. And uh, part of my job at, at school at RIT is to be continually testing and seeing what software can do. Um, in, in the photo editing realm and photo image processing realm. And uh, Photolab is, has very quickly become one of my favorite raw processing tools. And it's for numerous reasons. First of all, the control point capability, U-point technology, which we'll talk about within Sharpener Pro. But as we begin this demonstration here, I'm gonna minimize my GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, I, I've done some work to this image to begin with. In fact, let's just take a quick look so you can see. This is the original image as it was captured. This is a photograph from uh, Arches National Park. This is one of the rock features I've actually forgotten the name of, unfortunately. But we're looking at the before image, and I've used some of the tools within uh, DxO's Photolab 2, this, this specific piece of software, to sort of direct the viewer's attention through the image and um, kind of minimize distractions and attempt to maximize impact. So um, one of the things that I used is actually the repair tool. I got rid of the road that's in the foreground because I felt that line, although it's nice that it's a kind of a leading line that moves into the rocks, it's it's sort of distracting, so I got rid of it. And then I, I basically just use uh, control points to uh, bring out textures, minimize textures, increase contrast and so on in certain areas to direct your attention uh, towards the feature and then throughout the photo. So I'm going to say that this image is finished in terms of post-processing, except I want to sharpen the photograph for output purposes. Now, one of the beauties of Photolab 2 is that we have what's called uh, modules, camera and, and optics modules that actually marry the camera in the a lens system that you're working to optimize the raw processing because every sensor in a camera is gonna be different and every lens system and every lens combination with camera is going to react and respond in a different way. So what DxO has created are these camera modules that basically allow us to optimize the image as much as possible. And where that comes into play in our discussion here is the, the detail module here on the right side of our photo lab interface. And I've actually purposefully not downloaded the uh, module for this particular lens combination so that I can walk you through or show you the lens sharpness tool. So you'll notice on the right side that the lens sharpness tool is not active right now. It's grayed out. And that's because I don't have the module downloaded. But if you follow me to the lower left portion of the interface here, uh, you'll notice there's a little camera and then this little 90 degree arrow. And it's saying that we have the ability to download this particular module. So I'm gonna click on that. It's gonna tell me the combination that I use when I shop this. So this is the Nikon D810 with a 105 macro lens. I'm just gonna click download. That'll take a second. Once it downloads, it's actually gonna update the image. And now what that's gonna do, let's click close, is it's going to give us an optimized lens correction, potentially noise correction, noise reduction, and then also our lens sharpness. So now you can see that it's on, although we can't necessarily view it uh, because we're not zoomed in far enough. So uh, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and zoom in here. Let's zoom in towards our rock feature. And I'm gonna go to 100%, let's say, so we can kind of see what's happening. I'll give that a second to render. And then I'm just gonna click into the lens sharpness. And what, one reason why this is important um, is that our cameras have a, a basically a filter in front of the sensor that purposefully blurs the image to prevent other potential aberrations from happening. So the idea is it, it gets a little bit of blur, um, which gets fixed in post-processing with the raw process. And um, some cameras, some contemporary cameras actually don't have that, or they have an appended filter. So that's sort of a caveat. But basically this lens sharpness tool uh, allows us to get an optimized sharpening. So I went and turned it off, and actually you can see that the image is slightly sharper. As I turn it on, it's gonna render, you see it pop, and then this is the optimized sharpening for this lens and camera combination. Now, you can go in and do more or less sharpening and change the bokeh or bokeh, uh, the details in global sharpening. I've found that um, for, for 
initial raw processing, but the lens sharpness tool does what I need it to do. I love the response. And so I, I really don't do much else in terms of input sharpening or raw pre-sharpening is, is another term for it. So uh, I don't, I don't want to throw out too many terms. I want to show you Sharpener Pro. But there are a few things that I want to sort of hit upon before we jump into Sharpener Pro. One of them is the concept of multi-pass sharpening. And that is doing sharpening at different steps in your uh, image processing, in, in the uh, post-processing of your, of your photographs. The, the first one is the input sharpening. That's what we're doing here, lens sharpness. Uh, the second one might be creative sharpening, like using structure or um, uh, maybe clarity or textures or details um, or Clearview Plus here within Photo Lab 2, the contrast tools and so on. Those I could probably consider uh, to be creative processes and creative sharpening effects. And then the last step is our output sharpening, which is what we're going to focus on right now and from the rest of the webinar, basically. Uh, output sharpening is going to be specific to a few things. First of all, it's specific to how you're going to output the image. So that might be you're going to uh, put your photographs up on the web or online or on your website um, or on an iPad or some sort of maybe your, your phone or uh, mobile device or something like that. In that case, you actually want to sharpen specifically for that device, ideally. It can't always happen, but in a perfect world, you'd sharpen uh, for each one of those different devices. If you're going to be printing the photograph, you want to optimize your sharpening for the printing process that you're going to be using. And so uh, Sharpener Pro allows us to do this very quickly and very easily because one of the hard parts about output sharpening for print is figuring out how much sharpening you actually need to do for the particular kind of output that you're going to do, right? Because we're looking at these things on screen and they need to get translated into uh, basically what's going to happen in print. And th there's a whole number of things that have to happen when you take a photograph from a screen and send it off to a printer, right? So we'll talk about that. And I'll just, I, I can't stress the fact enough that the Sharpener Pro Output Sharpener, basically you give it some inputs, you tell it how you're going to be outputting the photograph, and then it sharpens for you the ideal amount. You have the ability to uh, change that, but the benefit here is that you really don't need to. It's kind of like this lens sharpness tool uh, that's that's built into the detail section here. It's optimized specifically for that output. In this case, the lens sharpness is optimized specifically for the camera and lens combination that you're using. Anyways, we're in Photo Lab 2. Uh, we've done our post-processing, so we've edited the photograph. Uh, from here, what we're gonna do is move into the lower right corner, click on the Nick Collection uh, button. And before we go into the output sharpener, what I wanna do, and this is imperative when using Photo Lab 2, you need to move into the settings output button because uh, we actually will want to resize the image that we're creating right now in this process, right? So as a, another sort of side note, right now we're dealing with the raw data. The, the Nikon RAW file in this case. And what's gonna happen when I click the OK button in the lower right corner here and we move into Sharpener Pro is a, another file is going to be generated and we're going to be sharpening that separate file. So for, for print purposes and for output like this, what I'm gonna recommend is that you move into this button. In fact, if you missed it, I'm gonna click Cancel. We're gonna just move back one more time. So in case anybody missed it or just joined us, I saw a couple bumps in, in people joining us right now. Uh, I'm gonna click on the Nick Collection button in the lower right corner of the interface. Uh, before we move into the Output Sharpener, we click into the Settings button. In Settings, there are a few things that we need to do. And first of all, I, I need to know how big or how small we're going to be printing this image. So we can basically set the right parameters so that we can sharpen for the proper print. To do this, uh, I'm gonna recommend for printing output, and this is dependent upon how you're going to print. If you have your own inkjet printer, this is what I would highly recommend. If you're going to a print lab, they will probably ask for TIFF files, but some organizations will actually want you to give them JPEG files, in which case you would process as JPEG and export. In our case here, for highest quality purposes, I'm gonna say process as TIFF and export. And then I'm going to leave my quality on 16-bit. This is going to make for a, a relatively large file size, 
but it's going, to, uh, uh, it's going to yield us the highest quality image when we print our photograph. Um, if we wanted to, say, go to web, uh, we would choose either 8-bit or 8-bit compressed, and we would choose JPEG, which I'll show you that on the next image. From here, um, I'm going to set the resolution, the pixels per inch, to the, the setting that my printer is going to be optimized for. So you do have to know a little bit of information about how you're going to be uh, sharpening and printing before you start this process. But, but it's, it's relatively simple. You can actually look up uh, what the ideal resolution is for your particular printer, or you can ask that of the lab. You can say, you know, what, what pixel dimension and that what, how many pixels per inch do you need so that we can get the best possible print. Uh, I'm going to sort of say we're going to print on an Epson printer. Typically, they're asking for 300 pixel per inch files for the most part. I'm going to make sure that my enable resizing is checked on for the little, uh, it's, it's highlighted in blue. And then I need to tell the software how big or how small uh, we're going to be printing this image. So in this case, uh, my largest size or my long edge is going to be 12 inches. If we wanted it to be bigger, we would just type in 20 inches or 15 or however large or small you, you want to be able to print that photograph. And of course, you can switch between um, uh, metrics, imperial, and then also pixel dimension if you prefer to work that way. Uh, interpolation, I'm not going to worry too much about right now. Uh, we're going to be, this is a, a relatively large file, and we're going to be down resing it. Uh, we can leave it on bicubic or, or have a bicubic sharper. Um, that is typically the recommended uh, way of downsizing or um, making an sm image smaller if you want a sharper image. I'm going to actually leave it by cubic for now uh, because what, what's going to happen is the software is going to assess the image and actually create an optimized sharpening for us. So I'll leave it at by cubic, but you could choose either one of these, by cubic or by cubic sharper. Um, and again, by, cu wow, by cubic sharper would be if you are taking a large resolution file and making it smaller, it sharpens it for you as we go. Um, and then ICC profile is going to be dependent upon the, the kind of print process or kind of output that you're doing. Um, in our case, with the Epson printer that I would be using, let's say like an R800, it can handle an Adobe RGB color space. So I'm going to leave it at Adobe RGB. When we jump into our next image, we'll actually switch that to sRGB as well. So from here, I'm going to click the OK button. That's going to set those settings into um, the, the settings system. Um, and then we're going to move into the output sharpener. What's going to happen from here is our raw file is going to be duplicated into a 16-bit per channel TIFF file. It's actually going to be resized for us as that 12-inch uh, long edge. And then uh, we're going to open up Sharpener Pro. And we're going to walk through the process of what you do. In fact, I want to I want to walk you through the interface itself as well. Uh, it's a relatively straightforward interface if you're familiar with any of the other NIC plugins. Um, you can actually see down in the bottom here we have a, an 8 by 12 inch image, or in this case with a long edge, 12 by 8 inch image. Uh, and it, it's for some reason stating 290 pixels per inch, but that shouldn't be a problem. And uh, basically to start with. In the upper left corner, we've got three different views, as many of you may be familiar with. If you're brand new to uh, the NIC collection, I want to walk you through this. But basically, you're seeing a sharpened image, and currently, we're sharpening for display purposes. If you follow me to the upper right corner, and display purposes would be if you're going to be showing your image off on a monitor or a screen or a projection system, you'd be sharpening there. Um, we'll end up moving into this drop-down menu on the right side of the interface and choosing a couple of these different settings throughout the webinar. But for now, what I'm going to do is double-click on our rock feature here. And what you're going to notice is that we have quite a lot of sharpening occurring. In fact, it's too much sharpening, but that's because we haven't set our parameters properly. But it's okay that it's too much sharpening for now. It's actually kind of helpful because it allows me to show you these three different previews in the upper left corner. Right now, we're on the single image view. And if I click the little checkbox on and off, you'll be able to see the before with that preview checkbox checked off and the after with the preview checkbox checked back on. Back on. <laughs> uh, the split preview. 
If I click into the split preview, this cuts the photograph into the down the middle by default. On the left is the original non-sharpened image. On the right is the enhanced sharpened image. If you click on that little red line, you can actually drag that back and forth and you can get a sense of your sharpening. This is going to be really important once we set our uh, the proper parameters on the right side, being able to view the image and kind of deduce how much sharpening is uh, what's gonna look really good. The third and final preview is a side-by-side -side preview in the upper left corner here. And, or, or in this case, vertical. Uh, so we've got a one on top of the other. On the top is the original, on the bottom is the enhanced. If you click the twirler, this little button in between the two images, now you're gonna see uh, the original on the left and the enhanced sharpened image on the right. And then also, if you follow me into the navigator, um, it hasn't changed at all as we switch through these different previews, but basically the navigator allows you to be zoomed into 100%, or whatever zoom percentage you're interested in being zoomed into and moving around the image very quickly and easily. A nice shortcut for that as well, if you don't wanna move into the navigator in the lower right corner, you can actually press and hold the space bar and you can actually kind of click and drag through the image as well. Nice little shortcut for being able to move around. Um, and we'll be using that shortcut throughout the webinar. So I'd like to present that if I can. The modes in the upper sort of center portion of the interface, we're gonna talk about all of these during the webinar. It doesn't make much sense for me to jump into them right now. So uh, let's sharpen this image properly for our particular output. So to do that, we move to the right side of the interface into the output sharpening, and uh, we click on our dropdown menu. And we've got our different modes here of, of output sharpening, and these would be our different modes of, of of output specifically. Again, display would be for imaging or, or showing a photograph on um, a screen, a monitor, a projection system, anything like that. Inkjet would be if you're going to be printing with your kind of traditional tabletop, tabletop inkjet printers or even large format inkjet printers. Continuous tone is a, uh, is a photo, basically an actual photochemical process like uh, C printing or printing off of a Lambda, and a lot of labs actually utilize a continuous tone printer. Um, so if you're sending your images off to certain photo labs, uh, you, you, know, you can ask whether they're using inkjet or something else, and if they say something else, it's probably continuous tone. It's not super likely to be half tone or hybrid device, but um, any specifics you can get, if you can even get them to say, oh, it's a continuous tone printer, um, or if it's a photo chemistry driven printer system, um, that's typically going to be your continuous tone system. For our image here, we're going to choose inkjet. Once we choose inkjet, you see that now the image is actually sharpened very differently, um, but we've got to choose a couple output settings. First of all, you have your viewing distance, and the viewing distance is should be set to auto by default. And it's typically going to be left on auto. Unless you know the exact distance that your viewer is going to be standing away from your photographs in your prints, you might change this. So it's, it's very rare though that somebody is going to be standing 10 feet or more away from an image that's uh, eight inches by 12 inches, right? So that's not common. Uh, in fact, the, the, the basic math that goes behind the viewing distance uh, is the standard viewing distance of the human eye is 1.5 times the diagonal of the print, right? And the software knows and understands that basic math and can extrapolate that into much more um, specific math that, that pertains specifically to the output sharpening for these different modes of output. So typically just leave this on auto and it's gonna give you the best result. But again, if you know the exact distance, feel free to change that. And it doesn't hurt to see what happens as you do change those things. But I think um, for all intents and purposes, when you're actually sharpening, leave that on auto. Then you wanna choose your paper type. Your paper type is a really important um, attribute to, uh, to choose here because different papers, different inkjet papers, absorb different amounts of ink. A canvas paper is going to absorb a whole different amount of ink than a glossy paper or a matte paper is going to absorb a different amount of ink than a luster or glossy or any of these other aspects of these prints. So when sharpening, you wanna be able to sharpen specifically for these kinds of outputs. And uh, let's say we were going to print this image out on a luster paper. I click luster, and then I just need to choose my printer resolution. 
And these numbers you can typically find uh, either in your user manual of the inkjet printer that you're using um, or in a lot of different forums, um, phot photography forums online. If you can't for some reason find your uh, find your user manual, you can you know, start searching for that. It's relatively straightforward. Uh, and the Epson printer that I would be printing on has a, a pixel dimension resolution of 2880 by 1440 pixels per inch. So I'm able to um, click on that printer resolution. And once we've set those basically four parameters, the kind, the viewing distance, the paper type, printer resolution, we actually have the ideal sharpening for this image, for this paper, off of this printer, and at this particular size. So it's very specific, but it is the, the ideal amount. And actually, as I double click to zoom in on our rock feature here, and I click on our split preview, you'll notice that it's a pretty dramatic change in this case. Uh, there's the before, there's the after. This is the ideal amount of sharpening. So it, it might look really sort of a, a little crunchy, a little too sharp, but for this combination, uh, this is the ideal amount for this particular image. And so it, if you double click to zoom in and it looks a little bit crunchy, that's typically going to be okay because there's, a, for the most part, a little bit of loss of texture and detail when the image is translated from screen into an inkjet print. So that's, that's actually the main reason why we want to be sharpening in this way and we want to sharpen a particular amount because the software knows and understands how much of that loss of detail we're going to have and it, it compensates for that. Now, should you decide that you don't like the amount or you want a different amount of output sharpening, you'd move into the output sharpening slider here. It's the next one down. And uh, this is, all four of these sliders are global adjustments, meaning if I adjust the output amount um, it's going to be adjusting the output amount for all of the image, the entire photograph, as opposed to utilizing control points to control particular areas of an image. We'll get into those in the next few minutes. Uh, before we do that, uh, I'm actually going to double click again on our rock feature. And uh, let's take a look at structure, local contrast, and focus on this photo. And then we'll move into the next image so that we're not staring at the same photograph in the entire demonstration. But basically, your structure tool, if you're familiar with uh, Viveza 2 or uh, Analog FX or uh, Silver FX Pro, structure is built into all of those tools. And this is basically a texture adjustment tool. As you slide structure to the right, you're going to be increasing that texture that's in the image. And it's not, it's not creating anything, it's basically adding contrast in a very specific way to increase that structure or texture. Local contrast is a really interesting uh, algorithm. As I slide that slider to the right, uh, what's happening is when you open Sharpener Pro, the software does an edge detection, right? It figures out where all of the edges are of these different objects. And uh, for example, the edge between the horizon and the uh, the foreground here might be one edge. Uh, the different edges of the textures of the, the scrub and the bushes that are here in the foreground, it's going to be another edge. The edge of the rock feature here is another separate edge. The software understands that. And so as you start adjusting local contrast, you're, you're going to see contrast enhancements in specific localized areas of the individual objects. It's a weird thing to kind of think about or to even talk about, but it basically increases um, the local contrast, the, the, the micro contrast, if you will, of these different areas. And where I find these tools the most powerful, structure, local contrast, and focus, is utilizing them with control points, because all of those algorithms are actually built into those control points. Um, the focus tool, it, do, it attempts to do exactly that. It basically tries to look at the image and bring things more into focus. Now, in, in this case, on this kind of photograph, I don't think we actually need any of these global adjustments. And I actually don't think we actually need any of these selective adjustments because I've already kind of gone in with Photolab 2's control points and optimized those things the way I wanted them to be. So I'm gonna leave all of those adjustment sliders alone I've set up the kind of sharpening that we want for the kind of output that we're going to do. So now the only thing we have to do is click the save button in the lower right corner, and that's going to bring us back over into our host software, in this case, Photolab 2. So I'll click save, that's gonna process the image, and then we'll have our, uh, our TIFF image that's going to be ideal for our print uh, right next to our original Nikon RAW file here.
so the original file, and then our optimized sharpened file for output. And that's it. The beauty of this software is it takes the guesswork out of sharpening for output. You just tell it those specific sort of technical um, inputs, and then it gives you the ideal kind and ideal amount of sharpening. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just take a look really quickly at our GoToWebinar control panel, make sure there aren't any problems. Um, cool. Uh, which parameters do you recommend? Okay, I see. So I'm going to save these questions for the end of the uh, demonstration. Carol just mentioned that the rock formation is called a hoodoo. Uh, oh, it is, yes. And it's balanced rock. Thank you, Roman. So that, that last one, these, this is balanced rock from... Um, Arches National Park. Thank you very much for that. All right, I do see there's other questions. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, save them until the end of the demonstration. So here's our next photograph. Uh, we have another camera module to download. Although this is a TIFF file, it's not an original RAW file. So I'm not actually sure, oh, look at all of those. These are all of the different ones that I need to import for um, these different images. I'm gonna hold off on that. Uh, cool, okay. So from here, what we're going to do, um, we're, this is a fully optimized image. Uh, we're going to optimize this photograph for print or actually for, for putting an image up on screen for uh, output to web. And this is actually a relatively common problem that might occur here um, where we, the photographer has shot a, a brilliant, beautiful photograph. The depth of field is really, really short. And um, you know that's on purpose, but we've got one eye that's in focus and one eye that's slightly soft. What we're going to be able to do with control points is kind of bring back a little bit of that sharpness, um, at least enough that it's going to be, uh, it's going to make us happy where we can look at both of those eyes and say, oh yeah, those, those look pretty sharp. It's a nice little sleight of eye kind of trick. We're going to do that using control points. So to do that, we move into the Nick Collection button. This time, I, I need to go into the settings. Basically, every time I want to sharpen for it, different kinds of output. I want to change these settings. Um, so to do that in this case, I'm going to have it process out as a JPEG file, just to show you the difference. Um, the quality, the higher the quality, the sort of the less compression this JPEG is going to have. Uh, you don't want to go too low in the quality while you're sharpening. But you also, it, it can be nice to actually reduce the quality setting, maybe 10% or so because it makes the JPEG quality, or it makes the JPEG file size far smaller. By reducing the image quality by maybe nine or 10%, uh, we can decrease the file size by 20 to 30%. And that takes you know, a JPEG that maybe was five megabytes to let's say three megabytes or uh, 3.6 megabytes or something like that. It, it basically yields you good results, but a relatively small file size, which can be very helpful um, for load times and uh, for other purposes like that. Now, if we're gonna be putting the image up on the web, uh, the, the, for the most part, most browsers are going to work in 72 DPI or pixels per inch PPI rather. Uh, and then also we might wanna resize the image for a particular pixel dimension. So I'm gonna switch from inches to pixels in this case. And then uh, let's say I'm gonna put the image up on my website and the sort of optimized size for that website is 2,048 pixels. So I'll go ahead and set that. Um, and, and so again, th this is in a perfect world, a perfect situation. We're gonna be resizing these things every single time. Sometimes it's, we're not able to do that, in which case um, you, you do wanna get the size as close as possible to how big the image will be displayed and to the pixel dimension, even if you don't have it perfect. Um, I'll say by cubic sharper this time as we're resizing this image to be much smaller and we're going to put the image up on the web. So I'm gonna switch that to sRGB because most browsers um, and most monitors, computer monitors are still dealing with sRGB color space. So we'll click the okay button and then we'll go into the output sharpener. It's still mad at me for not downloading those modules. So here we've got our image and it is optimized for, um, for, for display right now, but I think there's too much adaptive sharpening, which by the way, this software utilizes what's called adaptive sharpening for all of the sharpening that occurs for output purposes. And uh, what adaptive sharpening does is it actually goes and looks at the photograph 
uses contrast levels and attempts to sharpen areas and objects that are less sharp. And it tries to not sharpen the areas and objects that are already pretty sharp. And the idea there is that uh, you, you will be kind of making level, <laughs> if you will, you'll be bringing up the areas that need more sharpening and sort of subduing the sharpening on the areas that doesn't that don't need it as much. And, and what that means is we can get more sharpening out of the image without, if you will, over sharpening. Now, initially right now, I think the image is a little bit over sharpened, right? And the beauty of what we can do here is double click to zoom into our 100% so that we can see how it would display at its full resolution. And then because we're setting these images up on web or we're gonna be looking at them on display, uh, we can adjust the adaptive sharpening any way we see fit. So this becomes a little bit more subjective and it becomes kind of image specific. Whereas when printing for an inkjet printer or for a photochemical continuous tone printer, uh, there are ideal amounts and those ideal amounts of sharpening are based upon you know, size and uh, the kinds of textures that, that, the, that you're trying to print. The software understands that. When sharpening for display purposes uh, you have or you take more control into your own hands because what you see is what you're going to get again when translating an image from screen to print what you see on screen isn't really exactly what you're going to get in print so um, you, you do want to sort of think about that uh, so what we're going to do here is take this adaptive sharpening slider and i'm going to try to find a a happy medium where the things that are already sharp like this eye and the texture on her skin uh, I'm going to you know, increase a little bit of the sharpening so that it looks good. We're going to take a quick look at the preview just to see what it's doing. I don't think that this image needs a whole lot of sharpening, maybe a little bit more than 17%. Let's go to 23%. Click on the split preview and just see what's going on. Yeah, that looks pretty good. There's the before. There's the after. It's just a little bit. Uh, we still need to sharpen more for our uh, areas that are out of focus, or specifically uh, her eye here. And actually, you know, in a lot of situations, we we don't really want to sharpen um, skin tones. So what we can do is is actually remove the sharpening that's happening on her cheek here. It will still resolve as an in focus area, so there will still be texture there, but it won't be emphasized by our sharpening effect. And we'll do that using control points. So let's do that. Let's move over to the right-hand side and move into selective sharpening. Um, we, we can use color ranges. I have another image that I'm gonna display color ranges with. This is an image that's a little bit stronger for utilizing control points. But uh, for folks who are not familiar with, with U-Point technology, with the control points that are built into the NIC collection and into PhotoLab 2, uh, this button here allows us to selectively increase or decrease our sharpening um, on a particular object or area without really having to make a selection. All you have to do is click the add control point button and then place the control point on the object that you want to adjust, size the area that the control point is going to be controlling or affecting, and then move into your various sliders, which by default, you have an output sharpening strength slider if you click on the little expand collapse box, this little triangle that's underneath the control point itself, uh, it allows us to control structure, local contrast, focus, and then also our output sharpening. So in this case, we don't want any of the output sharpening on her skin, so I'm just gonna take the output sharpening slider to uh, the left to 0%, and what that's going to do is it's gonna reduce the sharpening off of that area. If you ever wanna take a look at the selection, or the area that's being affected by this control point, you move into what's called the control point list. Now that we've added a control point, you can see that control point uh, listed out there in the list itself. Uh, we can turn the effect on or off using this checkbox that's to the left of the label control point. So if I turn it off, you'll see the before, and now you'll see the after. It's actually pretty subtle. In fact, for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna increase the adaptive sharpening we're going to make it way too high right now, um, and then we're going to turn that on and off so you can see the difference. So if I turn that checkbox off, you can see the sharpening is being applied. If I click it back on, it is not going to be applied because we've removed it using that control point. If you want to see the selection that the control point is making, you move over to the right side of the interface or the right side of that control point list. Click on that, and now what you're seeing is a mask that the control point is generating, 
and anything that is white is being affected by the control point, anything that is stark black is not being affected by the control point, and then anything that is a tone of gray is being affected at a certain amount. The lighter the gray, the more the effect is, is or the more the control point is affecting and controlling. Um, the darker the gray, the sort of less the effect is actually uh, controlling. Now, in this case, we're getting this really photographic, very clean looking selection. And I would say this is kind of the ideal selection in this situation, uh, because if we turn this off, I really, I don't, I don't necessarily need to increase or decrease the sharpening in this area that's already out of focus. What I'm really concerned about is getting rid of the texture and the sharpening effect of um, the global sharpening with the control point in that area, in the area that's in focus, right? If I wanted to duplicate this control point, there's a few ways to do that. Probably the quickest way in my mind is on a Mac, you hold an option, uh, sorry, on a Mac, you hold the option key, on a PC, you hold the alt key, and scroll over your control point while holding that key, and then you click and drag. So it's option or alt, click and drag, and now we have an exact duplicate of this control point, except we've now placed it over here, so that we're removing the sharpening from that area. Um, if we go back over into our control points list, I can actually click on the box that's above the check boxes, and that's going to basically uh, bring us back over into our sort of regular image. So what you're seeing there is the effect of each individual control point. Now, I, I do need to go back and reduce the adaptive sharpening because it's actually bothering me that there's, there's so much sharpening uh, being applied to the image. So I'm going to reduce that back down to like 20 or 23%. And we're going to take our next control point and we're going to drop it on um, our somewhat out of focus eye. We're going to size the area of influence, which by the way, the, the area of influence is a circle but we're not necessarily making a circular selection. We're making a selection inside of that circle, inside the area of the similar tone, color, and texture. And the control point is basically figuring out what the object is, not necessarily that this is an eye, but it tries to figure out what the object is and make a selection that's very photographic and very clean. In fact, if we go back over to the control points list, you can see what's being affected by this point. It's basically all of the iris and pupil, and then a little bit into the white of the eye, and a little bit into uh, the eyebrows and eyelashes. And we can control these separately by basically dropping new control points. If I take a, another control point, maybe drop it in the eyebrow um, and size that area of influence, basically what's happening is this control point that we placed on the eyebrow is now controlling the sharpening of the eyebrow. And the first control point that is currently the active control point, which is why you can see the selection, uh, is going to be affecting just these areas. As you click and drag the control point around, you can actually watch it make a selection and change the selection in real time. It's pretty incredible. So I don't know if we need this, this fourth control point here. Let's see what happens as we start to sharpen this area because her eyelashes and her eyebrows are a little bit out of focus as well. So we might be able to give it a little bit of love and um, increase that sharpening just a touch. Now, uh, in this case, we could move into the output sharpener and maybe increase that a little bit. But I think what's going to really do us some good out of all four of these sliders is probably the focus slider to try and bring that eye back into focus. So I'm going to increase that. Let's see what happens. I'm going to bring it. Let's bring it all the way up to 100%. Let's actually increase the local contrast just a little. I think this might be too much, but we'll we'll look. Let's let's you know experiment a little bit. So I think we've got more than we need. But uh, if we go to our split preview and then we start sliding this back and forth, you can see the before and then the after. And I'm going to say that we have too much of the output sharpening applied to this one and probably a little too much of the focus. But we're getting that detail back. We're getting this nice contrast in that area. And when we zoom back out to sort of the standard view, I think what we're going to get out of it is uh, a really nice sort of balance between the fact that this was out of focus you know, maybe not shot exactly how it should have been, um, but enough sharpening in that eye to make it believable, right, as we zoom back to that, uh, that, that original size. But anyways, this is using control points to both remove sharpening from areas that you don't want it, and then maybe increase or add sharpening to the areas where you do want it. 
Uh, in fact, we could probably continue to add control points maybe to the background back here and then just remove all of the output sharpening to the green of the background because that's purposefully shot to be completely out of focus. So maybe we don't want it, any of the sharpening applied to it. Maybe we want to really uh, direct the viewer's attention towards the areas that are in focus, towards our subject, towards the gesture of the subject, um, and away from that background. And by adding in these control points and reducing the output sharpening amount, it's going to do a really nice job of, 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 of sharpening and of uh, controlling and directing the viewer's attention around the photo. Now that we're done with this image, I'm going to go ahead and click the Save button in the lower right corner. The software's still mad at me for not downloading all of those modules. Uh, but now we've got our um, original TIFF file and then the JPEG that we've generated for web purposes, for, for web viewing. Very cool. All right. Now, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to actually open this image up into Photoshop. So we're going to export from DxO Photo Lab. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to show you how to launch the software from Photoshop and, and some of the parameters that you need to watch out for, because uh, I assume there's a, a lot of Photoshop users out there. Uh, if you're a Lightroom user with the Nick collection, the software works almost the same way uh, as it does here within Photolab in terms of you will have your original RAW file. I'm going to launch this over in Photoshop as we're talking. Um, we'll have the original RAW file. I don't need to go to a folder. Let's see, that looks fine. Oh, you know what? I actually clicked the wrong button. I need to click this button over here because we want to export it directly into Photoshop, which it's not going to let me do, of course, because I'm in a live demo and that's what's going to happen. So we'll come back to this image. I already have a photograph open in Photoshop. But uh, basically, if you're a Photoshop, or sorry, a Lightroom user, the software is going to operate almost the same way as it did within Photolab. Uh, the only difference is to access the software as a Lightroom user, you just right click on the image in the preview, whether in the develop module or in the library module, right click on the image, go to edit in, and then the Nick collection should be housed in that edit in section of uh, Lightroom. But it's gonna work the same way in terms of your raw file will be duplicated into a TIFF file typically, and then you'll be editing from, from that TIFF data. All right, so we're over here in Photoshop, and I'm gonna speed up a little bit because I just realized that we're coming up on 45 minutes and uh, we need to finish this up and leave a little bit of time for a Q&A. So we've got our image. I've already done all of the image processing on this, uh, this snow photograph of these meteors, not really meteors, but uh, the way that the wind sort of worked this ice out. Uh, I kind of liked the composition and kind of what happened. So I'm ready to print this photograph, I think, anyways. Uh, the first thing that I need to do is resize the photograph to the size that we're going to output the image. Uh, so to do that, I'm going to go up into the image dropdown menu, go to image size, and then I'm gonna resize this image to the, the pixel dimension and output size that we wanna work with. Um, in this case, actually 13 by 20 is fine. I'm gonna just go ahead and narrow this right to 20 inches. So it'll be kind of 12.597. Um, and this is gonna fit on a, um, 17 by 22 inch paper pretty nicely with some with some nice borders. So I, I this is not a typical size that I print, but uh, I like that 20 inch width and then floating the image. I'll show you what I mean by that. So I'm going to click the OK button. It resizes. And uh, I actually used a filter within Color Effects Pro, which which might this might be familiar for folks who use Silver Effects Pro in the finishing adjustments. But I used a filter uh, in Color Effects Pro to create this. Um, this edge. And actually, now that I think of it, I've forgotten the name of the filter, which is kind of ridiculous. Uh, but basically, I've created this rounded edge. So when I print the photograph and I float it on a, a larger piece of paper uh, that may be necessary, I have this kind of nice organic feeling edge. And so if, if it were to be matted and framed, um, I can mat and frame directly into the image content, or I can leave this round edge and it, it looks kind of nice floating there, uh, maybe with a little extra bottom space for a signature or a title or something like that. So we've resized our image. We're gonna go into the Nick Selective tool and click the Output Sharpener. And what's gonna happen is the software is going to look almost exactly the same as it did when we were within the Photolab 2 export. The difference is that we have a brush button in the lower right corner and then an OK button in the lower right corner instead of the button that says save. But it does the same thing. So 
uh, we're going to move into the output sharpening section here. Click into display. And how about this time, rather than working inkjet, we will send our image off to a lab uh, that prints using photo chemistry, photo driven um, uh, process. So I'm going to choose continuous tone. Uh, and here you say you've got a couple different choices, right? With inkjet, you have to choose the viewing distance, the paper type, and the printer resolution. Uh, with continuous tone, you just have to choose the viewing distance, which again, I will recommend that you leave on auto, unless you know the specific distance in which the viewer is going to be standing in viewing your image. Um, and then printer resolution. And printer resolution is dependent upon the lab's printing system. So at RIT, we have a, a continuous tone printer called a Lambda. And there are two pixel dimensions or uh, DPI settings that you can send your Lambda prints to, 200 DPI and 400 DPI. The 400 DPI is going to render small textures and details better. And the 200 DPI is going to basically give us uh, an image that is slightly smaller, and um, it works faster with this Lambda machine because of the process that it utilizes, I guess. Um, anyways, I'm gonna set it to 200 DPI. And what we're gonna do is double click on our image and uh, we're gonna take a look at the sharpening that's taking place. Now note this photograph, I've actually put a kind of film grain on the image. So it, it's going to look a little bit more grainy than normal because um, I've actually increased the grain using uh, one of the film effects tools. So if we look at our split preview, you see the original and you see the enhanced. And this is the ideal amount of sharpening for this image at this output. And it's as simple as that. That's all we have to do. Continuous tone, viewing distance, printer resolution, done. Now, if you are um, the kind of person who does the same processes over and over to get um, you know, the exact same result because you're always using the same printer or you're always going to a particular lab, you can save these settings as a preset so that you don't even have to choose them every single time that you come into Sharpener Pro. Uh, to do that, you'd move into the upper right corner and you'd click add new preset. And basically any settings and attributes you have set on the right side here are going to be saved into this preset. So in this case, I might say uh, Lambda, uh, lam <laughs> Lambda print 200 DPI dots per inch, uh, and then click OK. And so now my preset would be for sending this kind of image off to my continuous tone printer. Um, in, in reality, I could actually set up a bunch of different presets at once. So because I do print with uh, both Canon and Epson printers, I might have a Canon uh, Pro 1000 preset and you know, an ImageGraph 6300 uh, preset, and then maybe the Epson R800. Is it R or P? I can't remember the, the title of it, but inkjet um, texture. So with, with inkjet, you'd want to set up the particular paper type as well. I'm going to say we're going to print this one on matte paper, and then we are going to that same um, Epson printer. So it's 2880 by 1440. And then I would just click the add new preset button, and this will yield us our nice, uh, ink, I'm going to name this one Epson inkjet. Um, 2880, I don't need to say 2880, but I'll just say matte paper. So I'll click OK, and now I have my Epson inkjet matte paper, right? I can make changes to those things and even click the update button. But anyways, this is the perfect amount or the ideal amount of sharpening for this image at this size for this particular uh, printer output. I'm gonna click back into the Lambda print, click the OK button. That's gonna bring us back into Photoshop. And one of the different responses in Photoshop compared to um, basically any of the other host pieces of software that you might be using, is that in Photoshop, we are dealing with layers. Uh, and with layers, you're able to utilize different layer masks, blending modes, smart objects, those kinds of capabilities. Um, and also, we can save this as its own file here. As, so, so basically, this is my working file. And from the working file, I would just save this. I would maybe rename my Sharpener Pro layer to be something like a working sharpening layer like Epson. Oh no, that wasn't Epson. We, we said Lambda and 200 DPI so that I know what this is being sharpened for. Cool. Uh, okay, 
So we're coming up on time. I've got one more image that I want to show because there's one more tool that we want to get into or I wanted to display. There, there are several more things that we could get into, uh, but we only have an hour, unfortunately. And I think these are sort of the most important aspects of utilizing the software. So uh, let's take this image into the NIC collection. This time I do need to move into settings. I'm just going to do this very quickly uh, so that oh, we don't need pixels per inch to be set different. Uh, I do want inches to be set different. And we're going to say this will be a, uh, about a 10 inch image. You could, we could make these massive, but basically that would slow our process down because uh, I'm streaming this webinar. So the larger I make that, the bigger the file is going to be. And therefore the, um, the, the more processing power my computer is going to need to do this. Uh, so I'm going to leave them at relatively small size inkjet prints in this case. So um, let's go ahead and notice our, our presets are going to be the same here, whether we're using Photolab or we're using Photoshop, right? We just generated these presets. Uh, I'm going to leave it on inkjet matte. This time, though, uh, selectively sharpening, right? So we can selectively sharpen this image. And uh, in this case, the water has been purposefully shot at this super long exposure so that uh, we have this really nice milky blue water moving through the scene. And so I don't want to sharpen that. And we could use control points. Actually, those control points would work really well in this case. But just so that I can show you what color ranges do, uh, color ranges allows you to sample a particular tone and color, either using a color, sort of the color wheel, um, or a color sampler. And in this case, I'm going to choose the color sampler. And we're going to choose a couple colors in the blue sort of range, and I'm just going to reduce the output sharpening. So I'm going to choose one of the lighter colors. I'm going to choose one of the darker blues that's in the water, and maybe the very darkest blue. How about that? The thing is, is I want to be careful choosing these colors because this is uh, selective in so much that it's finding any of the color that you've sampled and allowing you to control the amount of uh, output sharpening strength. But if there are those same color blues in these other areas of these high frequency areas where we want to retain texture and detail, um, we are potentially losing it from that area, which is why the, um, the color ranges works nicely in some situations and the control points work nicely in other situations. But let's like just take a quick look at the before and after now. We should have some decent sharpening uh, going on in, in the textures of our rocks and uh, almost no sharpening taking place. Boy, there's some compression going on with this image. Uh, but almost no or no sharpening taking place in the water there. But it looks pretty good to me. And that's how you'd go around utilizing your uh, color ranges. And I, was, I apologize if that's sort of a quick description of that, but uh, we only have a few minutes for a Q&A here. So I'm going to go ahead and switch back over to our GoToWebinar control panel, see what questions we might have. I'll try to answer those. Uh, if, if you can't or don't want to stick around for the q and I, I greatly appreciate you coming out to this webinar. Hopefully you found this to be a, a beneficial demonstration. And uh, hopefully you come again and see us soon. We've got a couple more webinars for the October month, and uh, we're going to be setting up some really cool stuff uh, for late October and November as well. All right, so let's jump into these questions. The, the first question here, in Photoshop, when you change the size for sharpening, uh, then change the size of the entire file, what if you plan to print the image at different adulation? A good question. So, so Carol, because... Uh, great question. And let me reiterate what the question is. In Photoshop, and also when exporting the image or going into the NIC collection from this settings section here, uh, you are resizing that file. And you're resizing it so that the software can um, sharpen for that particular kind of output and for that particular kind of print. So if you were going to print later at different sizes, you'd want to make sure that you had a working file that's not, that's the original pixel dimension, that's the original resolution that is not being changed, right? So what, what ends up happening here in um, Photolab 2 is that you'll have your original raw file, and then you'd have different sized outputs for your different kinds of output, right? You'd have different, so if we wanted to print this image at uh, 10 by 20, we would have an output for 10 by 20, and I'd send that to print. And then if I wanted to print it, um, you know, 20 by 40 or something, we would, uh, you would output, you'd take the image into uh, the Nick plugin, the Sharpener Pro, 
and uh, sharpened specifically for that size. So you, you do have a very valid and good question. You wanna make sure that you retain the original pixel dimension of your working file and then have iterations of your other files. And what I end up doing is I, I will, if there's a, a, an image that I'm going to print over and over again at a particular size, I would save it and I would keep it and I'd probably rename the file uh, but if, if I'm going to do a one-off or maybe I'm only printing five of these prints at one time, um, I will size it, sharpen it, and then get rid of the file after I print it if I don't need it. Because it, it, you know, at some point you've got a lot more files than you necessarily need to have. If, if it is an, an image where you're doing a lot of work within Sharpener Pro, then that, it would be smart to save that iteration and make sure that it's well-named as well. Great question, Carol. All right, uh, can you please explain how to use brushes? Yes, so in Photoshop, there's a brush capability. Uh, and basically, let's jump back over into Photoshop. Um, the, the brush capability allows you to use layer masks within Photoshop to brush an effect in or to brush it out. Uh, so I'm gonna delete this last layer that we just did, uh, go back into Sharpener Pro. I'm just gonna click the OK button. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna click the brush button. Um, and the brush button, this, this capability down here in the lower right corner, uh, it exists in all of the NIC plugins, and it allows you to click that brush button, and then you, in the NIC selective tool here, you're able to paint the effect in, erase the effect out, fill the whole layer, or clear the whole layer. So I could fill the whole layer in with our sharpening. You see this layer mask over here within uh, our, our layer palette is now white. If I click clear, it turns it black. But basically the way that these work is that uh, a white layer mask is going to reveal the entire layer, a black layer mask by clicking clear is going to hide all of that sharpening, and then if I click paint, I'm able to use my brushes within Photoshop and I can paint the effect in wherever we want it to be. It's kind of hard to see exactly what's happening, but you can, because I'm not zoomed into a particular area, but this might be helpful uh, if you want to utilize the control points for sort of like the initial control over selective sharpening, and then you want to paint the effect in utilizing this brush tool. In, in my mind, it's a good way to kind of get started with using layer masks, but there's so much, oh, I'm sorry, I just clicked the OK button or the finished button, rather the apply button when I finished, I kind of skipped over that. I just clicked apply and it sort of um, applies that or uh, sort of renders the final thing. Um, I, I don't find myself using the brush button very often, although I do find myself using layers and layer masks very often in combination with the kind of control point controls that we used. And, and so it's a nice feature to have if you've never used the uh, layer masks, you can get used to using layer masks here within the tools palette. But I would say, um, you know, jump onto YouTube or jump onto um, any, your favorite sort of web learning site and Google blending modes, oh, sorry, layer masks in Photoshop. And you're gonna get, you know, inundated with all of these different kinds of techniques. And uh, the, the first thing that you probably wanna learn about is using a brush on a layer mask or using something called a quick mask if, if you haven't used those before. They are fantastic tools and, um, in Photoshop, they're some of the most important tools, in my mind. It, of course, depends upon what you're doing. Um, but in photo editing, layer masks are very important. Um, Austin says, brushing in the output sharpener versus brushing in a layer mask. Yep. So Austin, I think I answered the question there. What's the difference between using the brush in Photoshop and brushing a layer mask? There's no difference. It, it, it actually does the same thing. It's just, it's sort of a, um, an entryway into using layer masks. Um, is using the brush tool from from the Nix uh, plugin. Yeah. Um, how do I know if I have the latest Nick collection? Good question. Uh, so the the way to know if you have the latest Nick collection, I think I closed out my Nick selective tool, is uh, in Photoshop. If you click into, uh, I think it's yeah. So Lonnie, good question. So if you want to know if you have the most recent uh, Nick collection. If you're in Photoshop, you go to the selective tool and you literally click on where it says selective tool and it tells you the version number that you're on. So we're at version 5.0.2, which is 64 bit, and technically it's version 2.0.4. And then what you would do is compare that um, to the most recent version. Um, 
like this is the most recent version right now, I should say, Lonnie. But uh, if you're ever wondering, you can just simply Google what, what is the most recent version of uh, the Nick collection. You should get a couple posts that come up here or there. And then, you know, look at the date of that, those postings, of course. But uh, this is the most recent version right now, version 2.0.4. Okay. Sorry, I can't stay. Oh, got it. Sorry, Phil. Good, good, good. Thank you. Uh, you may save. Yeah, Carol. So, yeah, you'd save different files at 16 by 20, 20 by 24, and so on. And then you'd want to name those properly so that that doesn't create confusion. Can you use Photoshop Smart Layers? Yes, Jeff, you can use Smart Objects and Smart Layers, Smart Object capability with any of the Nick plugins. Phil, I also love the Nick Silver Effects and Color Effects. They're all really wonderful tools. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm up on time. Um, oh, one last question here. So do control points also get saved into the preset? No. Robert, good question. The control points aren't saved into the presets because the control points are specific to each individual image. So the, the idea is that that could create confusion and problems if somebody doesn't notice that the control point is saved into um, a preset. So those are not saved. All right. Very good, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you don't have the software already, you can download a, a nice 30-day trial. The software actually does come with Photolab 2 Essentials. So if you don't have that tool and you're interested in trying it out, download the demo version of the Nick Collection and you can try out both Photolab as well as the Nick Collection. And I think you're really gonna like the combination of the two. It's a really wonderful set of tools. The control points within Photolab are absolutely incredible. And then the, the optic, the uh, lens and camera modules um, basically optimize your post-processing within your raw process. It's incredible uh, as to what it does. But anyways, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar today. Uh, have an absolutely fantastic day. And, um, oh, Pilar, you said you had a question. I didn't see it. Pilar, can you just copy and paste it? Because it must have gotten lost. Um, anyways. Thank you, Carol. I appreciate your comment. Oh, there we go. Okay, so Pilar, I have a doubt. Which parameters do you recommend when using output sharpener in case the same image after being edited and finalized should be exported in different formats? Oh, okay. So the, the that is a tif, like a very difficult question for me to answer because the the output sharpening is so specific to however you're going to output you, you need to have different versions of each image. So if you're going to output to web, you'd have a, an image that's been sharpened properly for web. If you're going to sharpen for print, you're going to have it you know, properly sharpened for that particular size and print technology and so on. So this is, this is very you know, uh, specific software that gives you the ideal kind and ideal amount of sharpening. Uh, that doesn't work for everybody's workflow. I understand that some people want like a, a one and done kind of thing that's gonna work for a whole bunch of different um, outputs. That's not what this does. This gives you the ideal amount for each specific thing. So hopefully that answers that question, Pilar. All right. Uh, have an absolutely fantastic day, ladies and gentlemen. Come back and join us again for more webinars, and uh, I hope to see you again soon. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye.